in the darkness I had longed, I had searched for the light But then I met the master And now I'm no more in the night One more time please Brian to help me there Oh like a blind man Who walked in the darkness I had longed, I had searched for the light But then I met Oh the master Oh and now I'm no more in the night For When he found me A new day broke All around me I The master And now I'm one of his own. the broken heart I wept all alone Oh, but then and then I met the master One more time, please. For all things were changed when he found me a new day broke through all around. I'm 
child of God this morning. Once again, open your Bibles to the great book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, we're reading two verses, verse 7 and 8. The word of the Lord says, only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do all according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success." Let me read that again. And then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. I want to minister this morning just for a few minutes, not hold you long. I'm, I'm, I'm going to preach short just until I'm finished. And I remind you that I'm a pastor, but I'm also evangelist. So when I say as I'm closing, that don't mean nothing. All right? I want to minister this morning. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name that is above every name, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our King. Lord, we ask this morning for your anointing. We must have your anointing to minister. Help me to present that which you have placed into my heart. Let my voice be sure. Let my words be strong. Let it pierce the hearts of men and women, not only here in the sanctuary, but those that are watching, those that are listening, wherever in the world they may be. And we give you all the praise and all the glory this morning. And everybody said, amen and amen. Psalms 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. Let me say that again. The psalmist so long ago under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said, Your word. Not the word of Buddha, not the word of Muhammad, not the word of Allah, not the word of Krishna, but the word of Almighty God. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We live in a time and a world that is full of darkness. Everywhere you turn, we are confronted with darkness. We are confronted with so many different forms of so-called truth. If you could look above the heavens and look down upon this earth, you would see all of these paths that claim to take people to truth. But it is a path of darkness. It is a path of unrighteousness. It is a path of eternal death. But there is one unmistakable path. It's not the widest path. It's not the most popular path, but it's the only path that will lead to life eternal. And the only way you can find that path is through Jesus Christ. And the only way you can have a roadmap that will take you to the end is for the word of all. 
almighty God to saturate your heart and to saturate your life. Understand something this morning. The constitution of the church is the word of almighty God. It's not the constitution and bylaws of some denomination. It's not what this religion says or what that church says, but our constitution is the word of almighty God. Without the Bible, there is darkness. Every country in the world that refuses to allow the word of God to be preached in that nation it is a nation of darkness, a nation of bondage, a nation of cruelty, a nation of man's inhumanity to another. There's only one book that can bring freedom. There's only one book that can bring liberty. There's only one book that brings justice to everyone, no matter the color of their skin or where they were born or however much education they may have or not have. And that book is the Word of Almighty God. Wherever this book is allowed, you've heard Dad say it, much Bible, much freedom. A little Bible, a little freedom. No Bible, no freedom. I don't know how many of you have been watching the news the past few days as it regards what's going on in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, China. We have seen in the past week thousands and thousands of Chinese, primarily young people, calling for their freedom. China and the mainland has passed a law that says even when, you got to understand something. Hong Kong was under the control of the British Empire to just a few years ago. When Britain, and it was under Britain, Hong Kong was a bastion of freedom on the mainland of China. It was the home of one of the greatest economic markets in all of Asia. It was a financial powerhouse for Asia. But when the British annexed it over, the Chinese government, which is communist, hello? Our politicians should wake up and see what it is. And they said that we're going to allow Hong Kong to enjoy the freedoms that it's always had. Communism and socialism can never tell the truth. They said, we're going to allow capitalism. Matter of fact, they had a slogan, one country, two different paths. Socialism, communism, capitalism. But understand this, socialism and communism can never rest until it controls everything. We have these idiots marching in the streets of America called Antifa. And I want to make sure you heard me right. They are a bunch of thugs. They are not representative of the United States. They should be labeled a domestic terrorist organization. They seek a violent overthrow of our nation from capitalism and liberty and freedom to socialism. And I get, ooh, it chaps my hide. It, it's a burr under my saddle when I hear stupid preachers get up and say that the Bible supports socialism. No, it does not. The Word of God promotes liberty and freedom, hallelujah, and capitalism. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible promotes capitalism. And I'm going to be preaching on that, not soon. I, I, I want to wait till we get into the election process. And if you're not, if you're not registered to vote, shame 
shame, shame, sh shame on you. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We are a city upon a hill. And to neglect one of the greatest frights and freedoms that we have as American citizens, which is to be involved in the affairs of our government. Hey, the preacher shouldn't talk about politics. Shut your mouth! The true God-called, God-anointed, Spirit-filled preacher of the gospel is more qualified to speak on the times and the issues of day than even the president of the United States of America because we know the word of Almighty God. You can put tape over my mouth, I'll just pull it off. I like what old Uncle Bud Roberts, a great evangelist many years ago who's died, he said, as long as I got hands, I'm going to hit the devil. As long as I got feet, I'll kick him. When I can't pick up my arms and I can't walk, I'll bite him. And when I don't have any more teeth, I'll gum him to death. <laughs> Hallelujah. We must not be silent. But they have been, they passed a law in Beijing that said that citizens of Hong Kong could be arrested and brought to Beijing for trial if they openly opposed the government. In other words, they have begun the crackdown upon their freedom. And listen, I heard somebody ask the question, a while back, how much freedom would you give up to be guaranteed complete safety in your home? My answer was zero. Amen. Yes. Number one, the government cannot guarantee anything Amen. except taxes. The government cannot keep you safe. I don't care who you are, there's not going to be a group of Navy SEALs camping around your house 24 hours a day, seven days a week to keep you safe. Bad things happen. But when you give up a freedom, you'll never get it back. Freedom surrendered is freedom gone forever. And so these young people, just as they did many years ago in Tiananmen Square, they have been marching, protesting. They've shut down the airport in Hong Kong for two days in a row. The president of Cathay Pacific Airlines, which is based in Hong Kong, a great airline, and he, he is, uh, I don't know if he's an American or an Englishman, but he uttered one critical word of some of the policies. He was just fired day before yesterday. The board of Cathay Pacific was forced to force him to step down. And the board of Cathay Pacific had to issue a statement that they are supportive of the Beijing government. And I don't know if you've been watching all of this, but we begin to see the crackdown that's coming. The Hong Kong police under orders from Beijing, the fact that the Chinese army have amassed trucks and troops on the border between Hong Kong and mainland China, ready to squash them as they did at Tiananmen Square. But something happened last week. Something happened that, I don't know if you saw it, but it moved me to my core. It shook me. I have a little clip. It's less than a minute. I want to show it right now of what happened in Hong Kong just a few days ago. Television, show that, please. Oh, say does the stars bring 
America. Thank God for freedom. Thank God for liberty. Thank God for the Constitution of the United States of America. But listen to me this morning. Our freedom did not become because of the intellect of men, but our founding fathers looked to the Word of God to establish the rule of law and the Constitution of the United States. Our country was founded on the basis of in God we trust. In God we trust. We are a Christian nation. We were founded on biblical principles. This is the Constitution and the Bible of the United States of America. And yet, there are numbers more than you realize in this country that want to remove the Word of God from the public arena. But they won't be satisfied at removing it from the public arena. They want to remove it completely where it's never opened, where you can't buy one, where you have to go to a library if you could find it there. But let me tell you something. As long as Sun Life Broadcasting Network is airing, we're going to preach the truth of God's Word, and we're going to proclaim the Word of God. Listen, they can arrest me. They can shoot me. But they will never separate me from the Word of Almighty God. The reason why we're the greatest country in the world, economically, militarily, liberty and freedom, is because of the Word of God. This book, wherever it's allowed to preach, it stirs a hunger for liberty and freedom. Those reasons why those young men and women are marching in the streets of Hong Kong is they're sick and tired of communism. They're sick and tired of their rights not being protected. They're looking to the only country in the world that guarantees life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it's because of the word of Almighty God. This is our freedom. This is our liberty. This is the only book that brings joy, that brings peace, that brings salvation, that brings deliverance to the heart and life of the individual bound in the darkness that we call sin. Sin is darkness. The deeper in sin you go, the darker it gets. The only light that shines in the world is from those who refuse to compromise the word of Almighty God. And I love this country. I love it enough to wear my patriotism on my sleeve, and I love it enough to say, not here, buddy. Amen. Not here. You're not taking the word from us. You're not taking our freedom from us. In studying and looking, doing some study on this message, I, I, I came across some written material on the Bible. I, I don't know. I want to read just a couple. I don't know who wrote this. I know it was from an English magazine published many years ago, but they didn't put the writer. But I loved what the writer said. He said, no fragment of any army has ever survived so many Bible battles as the Bible. No citadel ever withstood so many sieges. No rock was ever battered by so many hurricanes and swept by so many storms. And yet, it stands. It has seen the rise and the downfall of Daniel's four empires. Assyria bequeathed a few mutilated figures for the riches of our national museum. The Medes and the Persians, like Babylon, which they conquered, have been weighed in the balance and long ago found wanting. Greece faintly survives in its historic frame, and Rome of the Caesars has long ceased since ceased to boast. And yet the book that foretells all of this still survives. 
while nations, kings, philosophers, systems, institutions have died away. The Bible engages now men's deepest thoughts, is examined by the keenest intellects, stands revered before the highest tribunals, is more read and sifted and debated, more devoutly loved and more vehemently assailed, more defended and more denied, more industriously translated and freely given to the world, more honored, more abused than any other book the world has ever seen. It survives all changes, itself unchanged. It moves all minds, yet is moved by none. It sees all things decay, yet itself is incorruptible. It sees myriads of other books engulfed in the stream of time, yet is borne along till the mystic angel shall plant his foot upon the sea and swear by him that liveth and forever and forever that time shall be no longer. And he finished with one statement, the old book stands, the old book stands, the old book stands. R.A. Torrey said this, other books tell us what men suppose. The Bible tells us what God knows. Other books tell us what other men, almost as foolish as ourselves, speculate. This book tells us what an infinitely wise God who made us in all things and consequently knows all things has inerrantly revealed. This book makes men wise with the wisdom that is golden, the wisdom that brings eternal salvation. No one can study this book aright, no matter how ignorant he may otherwise be, without becoming possessed of that priceless wisdom that means eternal life. No other book has the power to make us acquainted with God and with his son, Jesus Christ, than this book has. And then he closed by study the book. Study the book. Study the book, 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 study the book that brings eternal life. Make it in your own experience, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. 29 years after Billy Sunday gave his heart to the Lord, he was a professional baseball player for the Chicago called then the White Stockings. They're called the White Sox now. He was a drunk. He, every, after every game, he would get just fallen down drunk as this is the early 1900s. But one night after a game, his baseball buddies and him went down to their favorite group of bars somewhere in Chicago, Illinois. They started drinking. They would drink in one bar, they would go to another bar. Then they'd drink there, then they'd go to another bar. They walked out of a bar, and on the cross the street on the corner was a Salvation Army band, and they were playing the gospel songs. And then a Salvation Army captain stood up and started preaching the word of Almighty God. The ball players began to laugh at them and mock them, and they started walking across the street, and they realized that Billy Sunday was not with them anymore. And they turned around, and Billy Sunday was standing behind them. They said, Billy, come on. He was the fastest man in the American League. No one could outrun him from home plate to home plate, from home plate to first base, the fastest. They said, Billy, come on. He turned to his baseball friends and the only life he had known. And he said, boys, go on without me. Go on without me. I've heard something that's stirring my soul. I've heard something just now that's quickened my heart. Instead of walking this way, he turned and walked the street that way and got down on his knees and gave his heart to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ retired from baseball they offered him a new contract double what he was making and the money wasn't that big back then but they offered him double billy don't do it it's just a phase you'll grow out of it he no 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 i found living water i found something that i've never known before baseball no longer holds any desire for it. what are you gonna do he said i've got a job at the Chicago Mission, sweeping floors. And he went from a professional baseball player to sweeping the floors of the Chicago Mission until God called 
called him to preach, and he shook this nation by the power of God. He said this, 29 years, he was preaching a message, 29 years after his spiritual birthday. He said, 29 years ago, with the Holy Spirit as my God, I entered at the portico of Genesis. <laughs> I walked down the corridor of the Old Testament art galleries where pictures of Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joseph, Isaac, Jacob, and Daniel hang on the wall. I passed into the music room of the Psalms where the Spirit sweeps the keyboard of nature until it seems that every reed and pipe in God's great organ responds to the harp of David, the sweet singer of Israel. I entered the chamber of Ecclesiastes where the voice of the preacher is heard and then on into the conservatory of Sharon and Lily of the Valley where sweet spices filled and perfumed my life. I entered the business office of Proverbs and on into the observatory of the prophets where I saw telescopes of various sizes pointing to far off events, concentrating on the bright and morning star which was to rise above the moonlit hills of Judea for our salvation and redemption. I entered into the audience room of the King of Kings, catching a vision written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Thence into the correspondence room with Paul, Peter, James, and John writing their epistles. I stepped into the throne room of revelation where tower the glittering peaks where sits the king of kings upon his throne of glory with the healing of the nations in his hand and I cried out all hail the power of Jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all hallelujah this is the book this is the book this is the book this is the book that will set you free this is the book that will change your life it's the only book that is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the story of Jesus. It talks about angels, but it's not about angels. It talks a little bit about demon spirits, but it's not a book of demon spirits. It has poetry, but it's not a book of poetry. It has history, but it's really not a book of history. It is the word of Almighty God. You cannot know Jesus Christ apart from the word of Almighty God. There was a group of preachers many years ago, a group. I, I, don't, I don't even remember what they called themselves, but the, 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 the main preacher had been a godly man. But he got it in his mind that he only needed the Holy Spirit and not the Bible. That the Holy Spirit would give him revelation. He wound up losing his soul and denying the very presence and essence and existence of the Son of God. You've got to have the Word. You've got to have the Word. Listen, for the sinner, there's salvation in this book. For those in bondage, there is liberty in this book. For those in darkness, there is a light in this book. For those that are sick, there's healing in this book. For those that are poor, there is prosperity in this book. For those whose mind is clouded and, and there's a war raging inside of your mind and in your heart, this book contains the peace that passes all understanding. It's the Word of God. Hallelujah. You cannot know and understand the message of the cross apart from the Word of God. Because not only is this book from Genesis to Revelation the revelation of Christ, it's the revelation of Christ and Him crucified. We see from the very beginning when Adam and Eve rebelled and fell. And let me just help you here. Eve was the one who succumbed to temptation. Adam was not tempted. Therefore, Adam's sin was a willful sin. Now, do you understand that? I know some people have tried to say, oh, he, he, he partook of the forbidden fruit because he loved his wife. No, he did not. He succumbed to the words, you shall be as God. 
pride entered his life. Do you know that many Bible theologians believe that Adam and Eve only existed in perfect, a perfect paradise for 40 days? Now, we can't prove that. But 40 days is God's number in the Bible of probation. Listen to this. Well, they didn't have a Bible. Oh, yes, they did. They had the Word of God. Now, it wasn't written down. It was one sentence. You can eat of any fruit, of any tree in this garden, but you can't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, notice, they were not supposed to partake of the good as well. That fruit they ate of was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, what's wrong with good? The good speaks of man's own self-efforts to save himself. That's why when you get saved, you not only repent for your bad, you repent for your good the things you tried to do to earn your salvation. And sad to say, most of the church is still trying to earn their salvation. Do this, don't do that, go there, don't do that, wear this, don't wear that. None of that happen, has anything to do with your salvation. And when they sinned, the first thing they recognized, they were naked. Our first family wore no clothes. They didn't wear clothes because they were bathed in the light of God's glory. God's glory overshadowed their nakedness. Oh, let me tell you this morning. I don't care how much of a mess you made of your life. When you come to Jesus, his glory outshines all your flaws and all of your imperfections and everything that's not clear. It just shines. Hallelujah. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And in the literal meaning in the Hebrew of earthen vessels is cracked pot. You're nothing but a cracked pot. But when the glory of God comes in, his glory shines through those cracks and hides those crowds. Oh, somebody needs to shout. They recognize their nakedness and they grab fig leaves to try to cover themselves. Fig leaves represents man's religious efforts to save himself. I've told this before, I won't tell it again because it's just too good not to. And I didn't come to tell it, it just popped in my mind. Years ago, I was preaching, and I'm not going to say what part, where and what part of the country, but it was a large charismatic church. I mean, very large. And I'd never been there before. Haven't been there since. <laughs> and the pastor walked up to me and said, who's your covering? And I'd never heard that term before in the way that he was presented. I said, Who's my what? Who's your covering? And I thought for a second, I said, the blood of Jesus. And this is his answer. That's good. Oh, that's good. Good. The tree of knowledge of good. Oh, that's good, but we need more. Really? What do we need? Now, I'm not exaggerating how the conversation went down. He said, I'll be your covering. We all need someone else to be a covering for us. I went, no, no, let me get this straight. I live in Louisiana. You live over a 1,000 miles from here. I'll probably never see you again. And you'll probably never see me again in person. But you want to be my covering? Yes. I thought he was a joke. I said, he's, oh, yes. And I stood there looking at him for a second, and this is exactly what I said. I paused, and I said, well, thank you. That's, that's very kind of you, but I'm going to have to decline. He said, why? 
I, see, I saw him perplexed. I said, well, because the only covering one man can give to the other is fig leaves, and I'm not sure what it covers. <laughs> so I'm not sure which way to stand. But I said, I know the blood of Jesus covers everything past, present, and future. Hallelujah. But you can't understand that great doctrine of sin without the word. And when, they, when their nakedness was revealed, God himself came down and killed an innocent animal, took the skin and covered them. By the time that Adam and Eve was driven out of the garden, the revelation of the coming Redeemer had been given to them because they taught Cain and Abel the proper sacrifice. And when the time came for them to offer sacrifice, Abel brought the sacrifice of the innocent lamb, which foreshadowed the lamb of God. But Cain brought the fruit of his labor, his vegetables. It was beautiful. It had all the colors of the rainbow and that beautiful display of all the fruit. But God rejected it and took the offering of his brother Abel, that little innocent lamb, and recognized it because of what it represented, the Lamb of God. And this man, Cain, that was too good to kill an animal, didn't have a problem killing his own brother. That's what happens to man without Jesus Christ, the Word of God. And from there, we see that revelation being revealed more and more. And I didn't come to say all this, but I feel the Holy Spirit push it. It's the cross. This book is about the cross. And I'm not talking about a wooden tree. I'm talking about the victory that was won on that tree 2,000 years ago. When they get to Egypt, God sent miracle after miracle after miracle. But after the greatest demonstration of the power of God that the world had ever seen and has ever seen, God divinely interrupting the affairs of the Egyptian nation, turning the Nile into blood. And every plague that God sent was against one of the gods that they worshiped. He turned the Nile into blood. They, they believed that the Nile was the source of all life. That's why the royalty took a bath every day in the Nile River. By turning it to blood, he was saying it's not in that river. It's in the blood that will be shed. Frogs. He covered the nation in frogs. It was against the frog gut. The more, the further away you go from the Lord, the stupider your worship becomes. Worshiping a frog. I, I don't know. I don't know if they went, got before it. Rivet, rivet. Rivet, rivet. I, I, don't, I don't know. You know, we shout hallelujah. Rivet. Rivet, rivet. And God covered the land. Now, you got to understand that. I don't mean there were just some frogs around. That mean everywhere you step, they covered every bed. When you climbed into bed, it went, rivet, rivet, rivet. There was a rivet choir in every house. Slimy. Now, I, I, I'm not a big know or not have a lot of knowledge of animal characteristics. I like dogs. I love dogs. I don't really care about any other animals, but there's a certain frog that if you lick it, you get high. I want to know how they found out. <laughs> I don't care about that frog. I want to know. <laughs> I want to 
don't know what happens if I lick this frog. Yeah, I agree. And so, cover the frogs. And this shows you the stupidity of sin. Sin, and, and I made this statement before, and people, I got a lot of angry mail, so I think I'm just going to say it again. Every sinner in the world is partially insane. Sin produces insanity. Oh, I don't believe that. Oh, yes, you do. How many people you know that are you say, why do they do that? They can't think straight. Without Jesus, your mind is not right. Hello? And frogs everywhere, except in the land of Goshen, where God's children live. Oh, hallelujah. There's a hedge. And, and, and Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron. They got to his palace. He said, get these frogs out of here. Okay. When do you want them to leave? This is the insanity of sin. Tomorrow. I've never preached it, but I, I, Dad's got a classic. He needs to preach it again. I probably heard it when I was a little. I've never forgotten it. And he's the master of titles. I mean, he could come up. I mean, you can't get any better than I know somebody who knows somebody who knows what to do for you. You, you can't get any better than flying missiles and atomic bombs and the second coming of Jesus Christ. I mean, you, you, he's the master of sermon titles. And he came this one more night with the frogs. That's how stupid the frogs could have been gone then. But that shows you how much man loves his sin. But in that prison called Egypt, God gave them the method by which they would be delivered, the slain lamb. It was when Cain and Abel, when Abel offered up his sacrifice, it was a lamb for a person, every person. In Egypt, on the first Passover, it was a lamb for a house. At the great day under the law of Moses, on the great day of atonement, it was a lamb for a nation. But at Calvary, it was a lamb for the whole world. And that revelation just keeps, I don't have time, just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I got to hurry up. It was now time for Joshua to lead the children of Israel from the side of the Jordan that spoke of failure. We're going to deal with that in a later message with the 12 stones that that was picked up out of the River Jordan and planted on the Hallelujah side and the 12 stones uh, from the wilderness side that was placed in the Jordan. And we're going to explain what those 12 stones mean, but not today. And he was to lead them over. Joshua means Jesus. That's what the name means. He was a type of Christ. We find in the first nine verses, in verses 5 and verses 7 and 8, the two things that would guarantee Joshua's success and victory. Number one, in verse 5, it was the eternal word. The Lord told him, I will be with you. That was the word of the Lord to him, I'll be with you. And as he was with Joshua, he was with you. And then in verses 7 and 8, as I read to you, one was the eternal word, one was the written word, Jesus Christ and the word of Almighty God and his dependence and obedience to that would guarantee that the waters would open and the children of Israel would walk over to the land of promise that God had given in the Abrahamic covenant. Hallelujah. Then he gave this word. Well, let me just say that your success in life depends on your obedience to the Word. I am 
Now, I'm just going to unburden my soul. I, I, I walk away from every share It was a little after 12 on Friday. I walk out shaking my head. What's wrong with people? We have, we have these infomercials on TV. Man, if you buy this pill, you'll get hair. If you take this vitamin, you'll, you, you'll, you'll, you'll all of a sudden get 30 years of youth back. Don't laugh. A bunch of you got them in your drawer. <laughs> if you don't have hair, buy this can and spray it on your head. I mean, they promise everything. They, none of it's real. None of it's real. But if somebody got on television, just held up a book and said, in this book is the answer to every problem of the human heart. Some book they wrote, they would sell them by the millions. But there's already been a book written. Right here. And over and over, it tells us if we want the blessing of God, we got to have a giving heart. But I walk away every share of thought, thanking the Lord for those that obeyed, but wondering, like, listen, everybody needs a blessing. Amen. Don't sit there and say, I don't need a blessing. Yeah, you do. And I want a blessing. But I got enough sense to know I can't have the blessing of God until I meet the requirements. Which is, all of God's promises, with the exception of a few, are conditional. You meet the promise, he'll deliver. And I, I, I just sit there thinking, we've got, and we've got a large audience. We know that for a fact a large audience. But for everyone that gives, there's 100,000 that doesn't. And I just, and look, we're going to be here regardless of what they do or don't do. But what's, what blows my mind is, don't they want the blessings of God? But they're closing that door. So your success in life depends on your obedience. He said, observe to do according to all the law. That means you don't get to pick and choose what part of the Bible you obey. You obey it all. Just like you have to, in Israel, in Egypt, when they partook of the first Passover, the Lord said, eat it all. You don't get to pick and choose. It said observe. In the Hebrew, that means to keep. It means to pay close attention to. It means to observe something for a purpose. And I love this meeting, the last, to attach one's self to. You can't go wrong attaching yourself to the Word of God. Are you here this morning? The Word of, now listen, the Word of God while being collective, it's to all. Never forget it's personal to you. It's your Word to you. It's God's Word to you as an individual. Then he said, turn not from it, the right hand, I mean, the left hand, the right hand, right hand, the left hand, meaning that we don't deviate from the Word. We don't look to something else. It's not the Bible plus. It's not Jesus plus. It's the Word and nothing but the Word. Then he said, meditate therein day and night. The word meditate means to ponder. And then to speak. And the word ponder means to weigh in the mind. That means that we, we ponder the word. We think about what we've been reading. How many of you, you, you've been reading the book of Psalms and you see that little word, Selah. And most people don't know what it means. It means when you get down the end, it says Selah. That means stop. Don't go any further. Until you meditate on what I've just said. What I've just said is important enough for you to stop 
and ponder it, look it over, take it to heart. That's what that word selah means. Don't skip over this. Don't get past it too fast, but think on this. Oh, hallelujah. To weigh in the mind, to reflect on, to think soberly and deeply. Luke 6, 45 says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart. That speaks of, it's not speaking of the human organ, the heart. The heart is, that word heart is used representative of the soul and spirit of man. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. That means this, your mind and your heart go together. Whatever you feel in your mind is what gets saturated into your spirit. It's like I heard a reporter one time interviewing dad. He goes, I'm going to ask questions. And I don't want a biblical answer. And daddy just looked at him and said, I'm sorry. (laughs) The the answer that I have to every question is found in the word of almighty God. You, You can't separate the heart and the mind. And what you meditate on, what you ponder on is what goes in and takes up and fills up the heart. You can tell real quick, talking to somebody that says they're born again by how much the Bible they read by their answers. You can tell how much or how little. And, you know, look, you're going to read other things. You're going to enjoy it. I love sports. I love LSU football. I don't, I don't really care about professional I love LSU football, but it's not my God. If they win, great. If they lose, Get up tomorrow, go to church. If, that, if LSU loses, there's some of you in the building. I'm not going to look. But I know you personally, you will not be in church on Sunday morning. You, you just kick it up. They lost. They lost. Yeah? And so did 50% of all the other football programs in America that day. Who cares? Now, the Lord t- gave us a promise. As our singers, musicians come back. If we observe, if we meditate, if we ponder, if we don't turn from the right or the left, the Lord left us two promises. If you'll obey my word, sat yourself, saturate yourself in the word, I'll make your way prosperous. Amen. That word prosperous has a different meaning than you realize. It means to be victorious. It's not God's will that you be in bondage to one iota of the flesh. Hallelujah. But that you walk in victory and be able to say, as Romans 6 says, for sin shall not have dominion over me. That's prosperity. That's prosperity. Not how much money you got in the bank, but the fact that the bondage that you used to no longer has control on you. That's as rich as you could ever get. Hallelujah. And then... You shall have good success. The word success is used in this verse means to be prudent, which means to be marked by wisdom. Proverbs 1-2 says, to know wisdom and instruction, to receive the words of understanding that refers to the Bible. You want wisdom? Know the Bible. You want to succeed? Know the Bible. You want to prosper in every area? Know the Bible the Bible. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Hallelujah. That's why we'll sing it here. We teach it here. We preach it here. We don't, uh, we, we, we're going to be doing it, it later on, not, not now, but later on, we're going to be revital, revamping the lobby and doing some, some, some repair work that needs to be done. And I, I, we, we've got church builders, you know, the, the architects coming in and just looking at things, you know, and just, you know, we just got it on the plate. We'll do it when we do it, but, you know, we're just getting ready. And, and one of them that we were talking to said, well, now, we're going to tell you now, now, do you, you know, all the churches are doing, I said, stop, I said, stop, 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 stop. I said, let me, let me just help you. We're not going to have a coffee bar. I don't care what other churches are doing. 
I don't care how, I, I, yeah, we're not going to have a lounge. Hello? We're here for church. We're here to worship God. We're here to hear the word of Almighty God. Why? So that you can walk out on Sunday morning and when the power of the evil one hits you, you've got something, an anchor that you can hold on to that'll get you through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and bring you back to church. Hallelujah. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Bow your heads, please. Urababashi paramahandaraya. Hallelujah. It's very obvious by the content of the message this morning that I was preaching to the church. But all day yesterday and again this morning, I felt that gentle ripple of the Holy Spirit telling me to give an altar call for souls. You can't make it in this world with your own ingenuity. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care what pres how prestigious your job may be. You're not going to find life and life more abundant without a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to ask the simple question to everyone here, everyone that's watching and listening. If your time on this earth came to an end today, where would your soul and spirit go? I know where my soul and spirit would go, but I can't, I can't answer for you. I can't see into your heart. And the church is full of religious people. They sing, they clap, but they've really never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm glad you come to this church, but coming to this church won't save you. You've got to have Christ in your heart. That's the only way you're going to make it. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, the Apostle Paul said, let every man examine his own heart to see if he is in the faith. I want you to look deep into your heart and be honest this morning and ask yourself the most important question in the world, is my heart right with God is everything right between me and the Lord only you can answer that question Father in the name of Jesus I ask that the convicting presence of the Holy Spirit stir every heart here in the sanctuary and everyone that is watching and listening And if you're not sure of your eternal reward this morning, I want you to raise your hand right where you are. We're not going to embarrass you. We won't do that. But we do want to pray you into the kingdom. There's a hand right there. Is there another? Quickly, quickly. It's time. We don't want to hold people. Raise that hand high that I can see it. One more time. Is anyone that would raise that hand? Brother Donnie, pray for me. In the middle here, here, there was one over here. Thank you. Anyone else? Quickly, I want everyone to stand. Everyone standing. And as they begin to sing, I'm going to ask this dear sister that raised her hand to come and stand. And I want some of our ladies to come with her and stand with her as she comes. Come on right now. Every promise in come on, the book, man. it's mine. Every chapter, come on, man. Every night. Come on, some of our ladies. I'm trusting in the Every promise. Come on, sing it. Sing it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every promise in the book is mine. Come on, this is your time. This is your moment to make history.
ministry in your life. Every one of you here and every one of you by television, by the internet, by Facebook Live. You may be by yourself in your house, an apartment. You may be driving down the road listening to this message on Sun Life Radio. It doesn't matter if another human being is not with you. The greatest person in the world is right where you are. His name is Jesus. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray the sinner's prayer. We got an email the other day and on Mother's Program and somebody blasting us play, pray the sinner's prayer. First, they told me that the apostles were ignorant and, and, and uh, illiterate. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting, seeing how some of them wrote books of the Bible. But then he said, there is no sinner's prayer in the Bible. Well, there, it, it's not exact words, but it's all based on Romans 10. <clears throat> and what I told him is, I'll tell you, we never assume that a person knows how to pray. We never assume that a person knows how to talk to God. There are many people that don't. So we just lead them along, but we tell them words, saying words won't save you but believing the words yes, will. Yes, yes. I want you to lift your hands as a sign of surrender and submission. I want every one of you in the building to lift your hands as well. You watching by television, radio, lift your hands as well. Jesus. And I want to pray this prayer, and I want you to pray it out loud after Jesus. me. Jesus. And I want you to believe every word that's called faith. Jesus. Now say it with us right now. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, come to you I come to you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'm a sinner, sinner. but I believe believe you are the Savior. Savior. I believe believe that Jesus Christ Christ is the Son of God. God. I believe believe that Jesus Christ Christ shed his blood blood on Calvary's cross cross. that I might be free. free. And I believe believe that on the third day, day, Jesus Christ rose from the dead and because he lives I can live also right now by faith the blood of Jesus Christ washes and cleans my heart I surrender my past my present and my future to Jesus Christ and right now I make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. And I can say today, I'm saved. I'm born again. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. By television, by internet, Facebook, radio, if you prayed that prayer, We want to send you this book free of charge, no cost, no obligation, entitled, What Must I Do to Be Saved? Email us, call us, and we'll send it to you. Ushers, hand out one to all of the folk that came down here. Tonight at 6 o'clock, Brother Lauren's going to be preaching, so be back with us. Come on, sing something good. every promise in the book is mine.
We hope.